Welcome to this unique approach to Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Unlike conventional book summaries, where we simply dive into key concepts and takeaways, we're taking things a step further. This discussion is about not just learning the habits, but developing and practicing them over time, week by week, so you can fully integrate them into your life for lasting impact. Habit formation takes time, and Covey's seven habits are no exception. That's why, throughout this journey, we'll focus on one habit per week, following the flow of each chapter. You'll get an in-depth look at the key concepts, practical takeaways, and real-life strategies you can use to implement each habit in your own life. Think of this as a guided mentorship, where we break down each habit, reflect on its meaning, and give you specific tasks to work on for the week ahead. This way, you're not just reading about the seven habits, you're living them. If you are new to my channel, please make sure to subscribe, because this journey is one of continuous growth and transformation. As you progress, you'll develop a stronger foundation of personal effectiveness, create deeper relationships, and ultimately find your unique purpose, one habit at a time. Ready to get started? Let's dive in. Chapter 1. Be Proactive Let's start with the foundation of everything, being proactive. This is the first habit Covey talks about, and let me tell you, mastering this habit is a game changer. Why? Because being proactive means taking full ownership of your life. It's about realizing that you are in control of your actions, your mindset, and ultimately your future. The key concept of Chapter 1 is response ability. Let me break this down for you. Covey says we have something called response ability, the ability to choose how we respond to any situation. Think about that for a second. Things are going to happen in your life that you can't control bad weather, difficult people, unexpected challenges. But what you can control is how you react to them. That's where your power lies. When you stop blaming your circumstances or other people, you start to take responsibility for your outcomes. Let's see how the proactive versus reactive people look like. There are two types of people in this world, those who are proactive and those who are reactive. Reactive people let their environment dictate their mood and actions. If things go wrong, they say, well, I had no choice. But proactive people, on the other hand, understand that they always have a choice. Even when things seem out of control, they stay centered, focused, and act based on their values rather than their emotions. Proactive people think, what can I do about this situation? Instead of just reacting to what's happening around them. And that's something I really want you to focus on. Next time you face a challenge, instead of blaming or getting upset, take a step back and ask yourself, what's within my control here? Now let's see what is the circle of influence. Covey introduces this really important concept, the circle of concern and the circle of influence. Here's how it works. The circle of concern includes all the things you worry about but can't control, global events, other people's opinions, etc. The circle of influence is all the things you actually can control. Your thoughts, your actions, how you handle your responsibilities. Proactive people focus on their circle of influence, while reactive people get stuck in their circle of concern. The more time you spend focusing on what you can influence, the more that circle grows, and the more control you feel over your life. If you waste your energy on things you can't control, you shrink your influence and feel powerless. So. What are the real-life application from Chapter 1 Learning? Let's make this practical. You can start applying this habit immediately by doing a couple of things. Take responsibility for your current situation. Maybe it's not your fault that something happened, but how are you going to respond? You're in charge of that part. Focus on what you can control. Next time you feel frustrated or stressed, pause. Ask yourself, is this something I can influence? If yes, Take action. If no, let it go. Change your language. Proactive people use proactive language. Instead of saying, there's nothing I can do, start saying, let's figure out what I can do. Change I have to into I choose to. You'll notice a shift in your mindset almost immediately. Now, how we can shift our mindset. Remember this. Being proactive isn't about being positive all the time or ignoring your problems. 
It's about recognizing your power in every situation. It's about becoming the author of your own life rather than a character reacting to whatever life throws at you. This is the cornerstone of personal growth. Once you internalize this, everything else starts to fall into place. You're no longer at the mercy of your environment. You become the creator of your future. So, start small, but stay committed. Every day, remind yourself that you have the power to choose how you respond and watch how much more effective and in control you start to feel. Now, what are the take-home messages from Chapter 1? I want you to start applying this on this week. Think about a situation in your life where you've been reacting instead of taking charge. What's within your control in that situation? Write it down and make a plan to act based on what you can influence. You'll be amazed at how powerful this simple shift can be. Take ownership. Be proactive. That's where real change begins. Chapter 2. Begin with the end in mind. Now that you're starting to be proactive, let's take it a step further. Habit 2 is all about clarity, knowing where you're going before you even take the first step. It's called begin with the end in mind. Think of it like this. If your life were a movie, you're not just acting in the moment. You're also the director. You get to decide the script and how the story ends. The key concepts in Chapter 2 is vision and purpose. Let's see the importance of vision and purpose in our life. Covey says the most effective people live with a clear sense of purpose. They know where they want to end up, and they keep that in mind as they move through life. This habit is about taking control of your life's direction by defining what success looks like for you. Not what society or someone else says success is, but your personal definition. Let me ask you a powerful question. If you were to attend your own funeral, what would you want people to say about you? About the kind of person you were, the relationships you had, and the impact you made? That's the end we're talking about here. By starting with that clear vision, you can live intentionally so your daily choices align with your ultimate goals. Now let's see the impact of creating personal mission statement. To help you live with this kind of clarity, Covey suggests creating a personal mission statement. This is like your compass. It guides every decision you make. Your mission statement should reflect your deepest values, what you stand for, and the legacy you want to leave behind. Think about it. If you don't have a clear sense of where you're going, you'll spend your life just reacting to the demands and distractions around you. But when you have a mission statement, you can filter everything through that lens. Does this decision align with my mission? Is this job, relationship, or project getting me closer to my long-term vision? So, what are the real-life application from Chapter 2 Learning? Let's break it down into practical steps. Reflect on your core values. Take some time to think about what matters most to you. Is it family, creativity, service to others, integrity? Write those down because they're the building blocks of your mission statement. Create a personal mission statement. Don't overcomplicate this. It doesn't have to be perfect. Start by writing a few sentences that capture who you want to be and what you want to achieve in life. For example, I want to be a compassionate leader who helps others reach their full potential while living with integrity and purpose. Use your mission statement to guide your decisions. Next time you're faced with a tough choice, ask yourself, does this move me closer to or further from my vision? If it doesn't align with your mission, rethink it. Now, how we can shift our mindset. Here's the big shift. Most people spend their lives reacting to whatever comes their way, job offers, relationships, opportunities, but highly effective people choose based on their end goal. They don't get blown off course because they know exactly where they're headed. You're not just doing things to stay busy. You're doing things that get you closer to your long-term vision. Living with the end in mind helps you avoid what Covey calls climbing the ladder of success only to realize it's leaning against the wrong wall. If you're not clear about where you want to go, you might work really hard but still end up somewhere you don't want to be. This habit saves you from that. The question is what roles you can play. Another important part of habit too is recognizing the different roles you play in life. Whether it's as a parent, a professional, a friend, or a leader, each of these roles requires a vision. Ask yourself, what do I want to achieve in each of these roles? That way, 
you're not just drifting through them, but intentionally shaping how you show up in each area of your life. Now, what are the take-home messages from Chapter 2? Here's what I want you to do on Week 2. Write your personal mission statement. Take a few minutes each day to reflect on it and refine it. Don't rush it. This is the foundation for how you'll live your life. Identify your key roles. List out the main roles you play in your life, whether it's as a partner, parent, friend, employee, or leader. For each role, write down how you want to be remembered in that area. What's the end you're working toward in each? Set long-term goals that align with your mission. Once you've got your mission and roles clear, think about the big goals you want to achieve in the next 5 or 10 years that line up with that vision. These goals will become your guideposts along the way. Finally, living with the end in mind puts you in the driver's seat of your life. You're not just going through the motions, you're living with intention. Every decision, every action is aligned with the bigger picture of who you want to be. And that's how you build a life that's not just effective, but deeply fulfilling. Remember, you get to write the script of your life. Make sure it's one that reflects your deepest values and dreams. Chapter 3. Put First Things First Now that you've got your mission statement and long-term vision in place, it's time to talk about how to actually make that vision a reality. This is where Habit 3, Put First Things First, comes in. This habit is all about prioritization and managing your time based on what truly matters. It's one of the most practical habits, and honestly, it's where a lot of people struggle. But once you get it, you'll start to feel a lot more in control of your life. The key concept of the chapter 3 is Prioritize what matters most. Covey asks a simple but profound question. Are you putting your most important things first? Or are you getting distracted by what's urgent but not important? There's a big difference between being busy and being effective. Many people are running around checking off to-do lists but never really making progress on what's most important to them. This habit is about making sure the things that matter most to you, your goals, relationships, health, get the attention they deserve. Now, the question is how we can have best the time management skill? Luckily, Covey gives us a great tool to help with this, the time management matrix. It's a way of looking at all the tasks in your life and breaking them down into four categories. Quadrant 1. Urgent and Important Crisis Mode Emergencies Pressing Problems Quadrant 2. Not Urgent but Important Proactive Planning Building Relationships Long-Term Goals Personal Growth Quadrant 3. Urgent but Not Important Distractions Meetings Emails Other People's Demands Quadrant 4. Not urgent and not important, time wasters. Scrolling on your phone, binge watching TV. Most people spend their time stuck in quadrants 1 and 3, handling urgent tasks, some of which are important, but a lot of which are just distractions. Highly effective people spend most of their time in quadrant 2, things that are important but not urgent. These are the things that move you forward in life planning, self care, building relationships working on long-term goals. The more time you spend here, the less time you'll spend putting out fires in Quadrant 1. So, how to prioritize like a pro? Let's get practical. Here's how you can start putting first things first. Identify your Quadrant 2 activities. Take a look at your life and figure out what really matters to you. Your health, key relationships, career goals, personal development. These are the things you want to make time for regularly. These are your first things. Schedule your priorities. Don't just leave your most important tasks floating around as things I'll get to someday. Put them on your calendar. Covey emphasizes that you need to schedule your priorities, not just prioritize your schedule. If it's not on the calendar, it often doesn't happen. Learn to say no. This is huge. To put first things first, you're going to have to say no to the less important things in your life. Quadrant 3 tasks, the urgent but not important stuff, will always pop up, emails, interruptions, other people's demands. But if they're not aligned with your priorities, you need to learn to say no, or at least delegate them. Now, how we can shift our mindset. It's not about cramming more into your day. 
It's about making sure the things that truly matter get done, even if that means fewer things get done overall. You want to move from being reactive, just responding to whatever comes up, to being proactive with your time. By putting first things first, you're intentionally choosing to invest your time in activities that support your long-term vision. Imagine waking up every day knowing that the most important things are getting done. You won't be running around stressed, trying to keep up with every little thing. Instead, you'll feel focused, purposeful, and in control. So, what are the real-life application from Chapter 3 Learning? Here's how you can apply this in your day-to-day -day life. Weekly planning session. Take 30 minutes each week to plan your week ahead. Look at your goals and mission statement and make sure you're scheduling time for what really matters. Whether it's working on a big project, spending quality time with family, or taking care of your health. Daily prioritization. Every morning, look at your to-do list and make sure the most important tasks are at the top. Don't just dive into the easiest or most urgent thing. Ask yourself, what's the one thing I can do today that will have the biggest impact on my long-term goals? Block out distractions. During your most productive hours, block out time to work on Quadrant 2 activities. Put your phone on silent, close your email, and really focus. When you protect your time, you'll find that you can get the important things done without distractions pulling you away. Now, what are the take-home messages from Chapter 3? In week three, I want you to take these three steps. Create a list of your most important Quadrant 2 activities. What are the things that, if done consistently, would make a huge positive difference in your life? Set aside time on your calendar to work on them. Block out time for these activities every week, even if it's just an hour. You'll be surprised at how much progress you can make. Review your week at the end. At the end of each week, Look back and ask yourself, did I spend enough time on the things that really matter? If not, what can you do differently next week? Finally, putting first things first is about mastering your time and aligning your actions with your values. It's not about doing more. It's about doing what's most important. When you do this, you'll notice a huge shift in your sense of purpose, productivity, and even your stress levels. You'll feel like you're finally living in alignment with the goals you set in habit too. Remember, life isn't about getting everything done. It's about getting the right things done. Start prioritizing what really matters and watch how much more effective and fulfilled you become. Chapter 4. Think Win-Win So far, we have got the basics down. Being proactive, knowing your end goal, and putting first things first. Now let's talk about how you interact with others. Habit number four, think win-win, is all about shifting your mindset when it comes to relationships and teamwork. Most people operate with a scarcity mindset. They think there's only so much success, happiness, or opportunity to go around. This creates competition, where one person's win means someone else has to lose. But in the win-win mindset, you're not looking for a winner and a loser. You're looking for a solution where both parties can succeed. It's about creating an environment of cooperation where everyone benefits. The key concept of the chapter four is abundance mentality. Covey introduces the idea of the abundance mentality, which is crucial for thinking win-win. This mentality says there's enough for everyone, enough success, enough resources, enough happiness. You don't need to take from others to get what you want. Instead, you look for ways to share success. With this mindset, you're not just trying to get ahead of others, but rather, you're looking for solutions that benefit everyone involved. This approach builds trust, strengthens relationships, and ultimately creates more opportunities for collaboration. Now, what are the win-lose, lose-win, and lose-lose situation anyway? Before you fully grasp win-win, it's important to recognize the other mentalities people often fall into. Win-lose, I win, you lose. This is the competitive mindset, where one person's success comes at the expense of someone else. It often leads to resentment. Lose-win, you win, I lose. This is when someone sacrifices their own needs or desires to make others happy. It can lead to bitterness or feeling undervalued. Lose-lose. 
When two people are so focused on defeating the other that they both lose, think of it like a toxic argument where nobody wins. Win-win, on the other hand, looks for solutions where both parties walk away feeling good about the outcome. It's about building mutually beneficial relationships where success is shared, not hoarded. So, how to apply win-win thinking? Here's how you can start thinking win-win in your daily life. Look for mutual benefit in any situation, whether it's a business deal, a conflict, or even a simple conversation. Ask yourself, how can both of us win here? Instead of focusing only on your own goals, think about how the other person can benefit too. Practice empathy. To think win-win, you have to understand the other person's perspective. Listen actively and try to understand what they truly want. This helps you find a solution that works for both of you. Build trust. Win-win thinking thrives in relationships built on trust. Be honest, reliable, and fair in your dealings. When people trust you, they're more willing to work together for a mutually beneficial outcome. Now, how we can shift our mindset. Here's the shift you need to make. Stop thinking of life as a competition. If you're constantly trying to win at the expense of others, you'll find yourself stuck in toxic situations where nobody's truly happy. Instead, adopt the abundance mentality. There's enough to go around. When you help others win, you're not sacrificing your own success. In fact, you're multiplying it. This doesn't mean you should let others walk all over you or accept unfair compromises. Win-win is about creating balanced solutions that respect both your needs and the other person's. So, what are the real-life application from Chapter 3 Learning? Let's put this into practice. Next time you negotiate, whether it's at work or in your personal life, make sure you're looking for ways to create a win for the other person, not just yourself. During conflicts, pause and ask yourself, how can we both benefit from this situation? Instead of trying to win the argument, focus on finding a solution that leaves both parties satisfied. Build relationships based on trust. When people trust you, win-win solutions become much easier to achieve. Trust grows through consistent actions, honesty, and empathy. So, what are the take-home messages from Chapter 4 Learning? On Week 4, I want you to look for one situation where you can apply win-win thinking. Whether it's at work, with a friend, or at home, ask yourself, how can we both come out winners here? Start practicing this mindset and watch how your relationships transform. Finally, thinking win-win will fundamentally change how you interact with others. Instead of competing or compromising, you'll start collaborating and creating lasting partnerships. When you think win-win, you build trust, foster cooperation, and ultimately create better outcomes for everyone involved. Chapter 5. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Now let's dive into habit number 5, one of the most powerful habits you can cultivate in your relationships. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. This habit is about truly listening to others before you offer your own perspective. And I'm not talking about listening just to reply. This is about listening to understand. Covey says that most people listen with the intent to respond, not to understand. You might think you're paying attention, but in reality, you're already preparing your rebuttal in your head. To be an effective communicator and to build strong relationships, you need to reverse this. Start by deeply understanding where the other person is coming from before you even think about sharing your own thoughts. The key concept of the Chapter 5 is Empathic Listening. Covey introduces the concept of empathic listening, which is different from just hearing someone's words. It's about really putting yourself in their shoes, listening with your eyes, your heart, and your mind. You're not just hearing the words they say. You're trying to understand their feelings, their concerns, and their perspective. When you practice empathic listening, you make the other person feel heard, valued, and understood. And this is critical because, let's be honest, we all want to feel understood. It's a fundamental human need. When someone feels understood, they're far more likely to be open to your perspective, creating a foundation for effective communication. Now let's pay attention to the power of understanding. 
By seeking to understand first, you build trust and respect. It shows the other person that you're not just interested in pushing your own agenda. You genuinely care about what they have to say. And here's the kicker. When you take the time to fully understand someone else's perspective, they're much more open to hearing and understanding yours. So, what are the real-life applications from Chapter 5 Learning? Let's break it down. Listen with the intent to understand. Next time you're in a conversation, don't interrupt. Don't prepare your reply while the other person is talking. Just listen. Pay attention not only to their words, but also to their tone, body language, and emotions. Ask clarifying questions. If you're not sure you fully understand, ask questions to clarify. Say things like, can you tell me more about that? Or, how did that make you feel? This shows that you're genuinely interested in their point of view. Summarize what they said. After listening, try summarizing what the other person said in your own words. For example, so what I'm hearing is that you feel frustrated because this not only confirms that you're paying attention, but also helps clear up any misunderstandings. Now, how we can shift our mindset. Here's the shift. Stop trying to win conversations or debates by getting your point across first. Instead, focus on truly understanding the other person's perspective. Once they feel heard and understood, you'll find that communication becomes much more effective and people are more willing to hear your point of view too. When you approach communication this way, you create a space for meaningful dialogue. Instead of trying to prove your point or fix the other person's problem right away, you give them the space to express themselves fully. Let's see a real-life example. Think about a time when someone really listened to you. How did it make you feel? Chances are, you felt valued and respected. That's the power of empathic listening. Now, imagine giving that gift to someone else. Whether it's a coworker, friend, or family member, when you listen first, you build trust, strengthen relationships, and create an environment where both parties feel understood. So, what are the take-home messages from Chapter 5 Learning? Here's what I want you to try on Week 5. Choose a conversation, whether it's with a colleague, a partner, or a friend, where you make a conscious effort to listen first. Don't interrupt, don't judge, and don't offer advice right away. Just focus on understanding. Ask clarifying questions if needed. Make sure you really understand their perspective before sharing your own. Practice summarizing what they said. Once you're sure you've understood them, only then share your own thoughts. You'll notice a huge difference in how the conversation flows. Finally, by seeking first to understand, you unlock the door to genuine communication and trust. This habit is essential not only for resolving conflicts, but also for building deeper, more meaningful relationships. When people feel heard and understood, they're far more likely to listen to you in return. Remember, effective communication isn't just about being heard. It's about truly hearing others. And when you master this habit, you'll find that people start to naturally gravitate toward you because they feel understood and valued in your presence. Chapter 6. Synergize Now that we have mastered listening and understanding, it's time to take your communication and teamwork to the next level with Habit 6. Synergize. This is where the magic happens where the whole becomes greater than the sum of its parts. Covey calls synergy the essence of principled-centered leadership because it's about creating new possibilities by working together in harmony. The key concept of the Chapter 6 is creative cooperation. Synergy is about harnessing the strengths and perspectives of others to achieve results that you couldn't accomplish alone. It's based on the principle that two, or more, Minds working together can create a better solution than either could on their own. This doesn't happen by chance. It's a conscious effort to bring together diverse ideas and build something greater. Think of synergy as 1 plus 1 is equal to 3 or even more. When people with different strengths, experiences, and insights collaborate, they come up with ideas that are more creative, innovative, and effective than anything an individual could produce on their own. Let's see the power of differences. Covey emphasizes the importance of valuing differences. People often avoid working with others who think differently because it can be uncomfortable or challenging. 
But these differences are where true synergy lies. It's through constructive differences, different ways of thinking, different skills, different perspectives, that you find the best solutions. Instead of viewing differences as obstacles, start seeing them as opportunities. When you value other people's strengths and unique viewpoints, you unlock creative solutions that wouldn't be possible if everyone thought the same way. Now how to create synergy. Synergy doesn't just happen. It requires deliberate effort. Here's how you can start creating it in your own life. Embrace diversity. Whether it's in your team at work or in your personal relationships, recognize that everyone brings something unique to the table. Don't shy away from differences. Lean into them. Actively seek out perspectives that challenge your own. Practice empathic communication. Remember habit five, seek first to understand. When you're working with others, listen deeply to their ideas and viewpoints. Even if they seem completely opposite to yours, there's value in understanding where they're coming from. Look for the third alternative. Instead of compromising or settling for my way or your way, aim to find a third alternative, a solution that neither of you initially thought of, but that's better than either of your original ideas. This is where true synergy comes into play. Now, how we can shift our mindset. Here's the shift. Stop thinking that teamwork is about compromising or splitting the difference. Synergy isn't about compromise. It's about creating something new and better. When you value others' contributions and combine them with your own, you get solutions that are far greater than what either of you could achieve individually. Synergy is the realization that the differences between people don't have to divide us. They can actually bring us closer to better outcomes. Instead of just tolerating diversity, celebrate it and use it as a tool for greater creativity. So, what are the real-life application from Chapter 6 Learning? In real life, synergy can be seen in all kinds of collaborative efforts. Whether you're brainstorming with a team at work or working on a family project, here's how you can bring synergy into your life. Work on collaborative projects where you actively invite input from others. Don't just lead the team. Involve everyone's ideas, especially those that are different from your own. During problem-solving sessions, challenge your team or yourself to find a third alternative a solution that's better than either of your initial ideas. Encourage open-mindedness and creativity. Be open to feedback and other ways of thinking. Instead of shutting down ideas that differ from yours, explore them. Ask, what can I learn from this perspective? Now, what are the take-home messages from Chapter 6 Learning? On Week 6, I want you to find a situation, whether at work, at home, or with friends where you can practice synergy. Collaborate with someone who has a different perspective or skill set than you. Look for a third alternative and see if you can create a solution that's better than what either of you could have come up with on your own. Finally, synergy is about teamwork at its highest level. It's about working together in a way that creates more than the sum of individual contributions. When you start to see differences as strengths rather than obstacles, you open yourself up to new, creative possibilities. Whether it's in your work, family, or community, synergy is the key to unlocking extraordinary results. Chapter 7. Sharpen the Saw We've now learned how to interact effectively with yourself and others, but there's one last habit that ties it all together. Sharpen the Saw. Habit 7 is about self-renewal. It's the habit that makes all the other habits possible. Imagine you're cutting down a tree with a dull saw. You'll eventually get the job done, but it'll take much longer and be a lot harder than if you took the time to sharpen the saw first. In other words, you need to take care of yourself, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, so you can continue growing and improving in all areas of your life. The key concept of Chapter 7 is Balanced Self-Renewal Covey emphasizes the importance of maintaining balance in the four areas of life. Physical, exercise, nutrition, rest. Mental, learning, reading, self-reflection. Emotional or social, relationships, empathy, service. Spiritual, meditation, values, connection to purpose. 
When you sharpen the saw, you're renewing and re-energizing yourself in these areas. This renewal process keeps you strong and capable of continuously improving and contributing. If you neglect any of these areas, you risk burning out or losing balance. So, how to sharpen the saw in our real life? Let's break this down so you can start applying it today. Physical renewal, take care of your body. Regular exercise, eating healthy, getting enough sleep. All of these are essential for keeping your energy up and your mind sharp. If you don't take care of your body, everything else suffers. Mental renewal, keep learning. Whether it's through reading, taking courses, or just staying curious, never stop expanding your mind. Covey suggests dedicating time to personal development and continuous learning to keep your mind sharp and agile. Emotional or social renewal. Build strong, meaningful relationships. This can be with friends, family, colleagues, or your community. Healthy relationships provide emotional support and help you stay grounded. Regularly connect with the people who matter to you and make time for empathy, service, and emotional growth. Spiritual renewal. This is about connecting with your deeper purpose and values. For some, this might be through meditation, prayer, or spending time in nature. For others, it might be through art, music, or community service. The goal is to regularly reconnect with the things that give your life meaning. Now, how we can shift our mindset. You are your most important asset. You can't be truly effective in life if you're constantly running on empty. Sharpening the saw is about investing in yourself so you can continue to grow and contribute. Too often, people think they don't have time for self-care. But here's the truth. If you don't take time to renew yourself, you'll eventually burn out and everything you're trying to achieve will suffer. Self-renewal isn't a luxury, it's a necessity. So, what are the real-life application from Chapter 7 Learning? To sharpen your saw, make sure you're paying attention to all four dimensions of your life. Set aside time each week for physical activity, whether it's going for a walk, hitting the gym, or doing yoga. It doesn't need to be intense, just something to keep your body in shape. Create a reading list or set personal development goals. This could be learning a new skill, reading books, or taking courses that challenge your mind. Schedule regular time for relationships. Whether it's date nights, family dinners, or coffee with friends, don't neglect the emotional and social side of life. Reflect on your values and purpose. Spend time each week reconnecting with your why. Journaling, meditation, or spending time in nature can help you stay grounded in what truly matters. Now, what are the take-home messages from Chapter 7 Learning? On Week 7, I want you to identify one area, physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual, where you feel like you've been neglecting yourself. Take one small step to start renewing that area of your life. Whether it's a short workout, reading a chapter of a book, or having a meaningful conversation with a loved one, start sharpening your saw. Finally, Habit 7 is all about continuous growth and renewal. When you take care of yourself holistically, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, you become more effective in every area of your life. Sharpening the saw isn't something you do once. It's an ongoing process that allows you to maintain balance and keep improving. Remember, you can't pour from an empty cup. Make sure you're taking time to refill your own, so you can continue to grow, contribute, and live a truly effective life. Chapter 8. From Effectiveness to Greatness, Find Your Voice Now, let's move into the final chapter, From Effectiveness to Greatness. You've already learned how to be effective. You know how to manage your time, build meaningful relationships, and take care of yourself. But Covey encourages you to go beyond just effectiveness. In Chapter 8, he introduces the concept of finding your voice, a deeper sense of personal meaning and fulfillment. It's about discovering what makes you unique and using that to contribute to the world in a powerful way. The key concept of the final chapter is finding your voice. Finding your voice means identifying what you're truly passionate about, what drives you, and how you can use your unique talents to serve others. 
Covey believes that every individual has a voice, an innate potential to make a meaningful contribution, but it requires self-reflection and self-awareness to find it. Your voice lies at the intersection of four things. What you love, passion. What you're great at, talent. What the world needs, need. What you can get paid for, conscience. When you find this sweet spot, you're not just effective, you're operating at a level of greatness. You're living in alignment with your purpose. Now how to find your voice. Reflect on your talents and strengths. What are you naturally good at? What activities make you feel energized and alive? These are clues to where your voice may lie. Listen to your inner conscience. What issues or causes do you care deeply about? What injustices do you feel called to address? Your voice often connects to things that tug at your heart. Align your work with your values. Think about how you can bring more of your passions and strengths into what you do every day. Even if you can't change your job right away, look for ways to incorporate your voice into your work or personal life. Serve others. Finding your voice isn't just about personal success. It's about making a contribution to others. When you use your talents in service of something greater than yourself, you experience a sense of fulfillment that goes beyond material success. Let's see the impact of finding your voice. When you find your voice, you'll not only achieve personal fulfillment, but you'll also inspire others to do the same. As Covey explains, greatness isn't just about reaching your own goals. It's about empowering others to find their voice too. Leaders who have found their voice create environments where others can thrive, collaborate, and contribute at their highest levels. So, what are the real-life applications from Chapter 8 Learning? Here's how you can start finding your voice in your everyday life. Spend time in self-reflection. Ask yourself, what are my greatest strengths? What am I passionate about? What kind of impact do I want to have on the world? Take action toward your purpose. Whether it's volunteering for a cause you care about, pursuing a passion project, or looking for ways to serve others in your job, start taking steps to align your life with your deeper purpose. Encourage others to find their voice. As you discover your own voice, help others do the same. Support your team, friends, or family in uncovering their unique strengths and passions. Concluding Remarks of Becoming Truly Great By now, you've gone through each of the seven habits, building a foundation for personal and interpersonal effectiveness. But as we wrap up, I want to leave you with this thought. Effectiveness is just the beginning. Covey's message is clear. The goal is not just to be effective, it's to become great. And greatness isn't measured by success alone. It's measured by how well you contribute to the world and how much you help others along the way. The seven habits are not a checklist of actions to complete. They're a continuous process of growth. The more you practice these habits, the more you'll see that they interconnect and build upon each other. You'll become proactive by taking responsibility for your life. Begin with the end in mind by staying focused on your long-term goals. Put first things first by prioritizing what truly matters. Think win-win by fostering collaborative, mutually beneficial relationships. Seek first to understand, then to be understood by listening deeply and communicating effectively. Synergize by working creatively and cooperatively with others. Sharpen the saw by investing in your own physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being. But beyond these habits, the ultimate goal is to find your voice, to discover your unique purpose, and to use it to uplift others. That's what will take you from being effective to being truly great. The final call to action. As you move forward, keep these habits close. Integrate them into your daily life not as separate tasks, but as guiding principles that shape your thoughts, actions, and relationships. And most importantly, find your voice. The world needs the unique contribution that only you can make. Take what you've learned and put it into action. Whether you're at the start of your journey or already far along, remember that personal growth is a lifelong process. As you continue to sharpen these habits, you'll unlock new levels of effectiveness, fulfillment, 
and greatness. Go out there and make a difference, not just for yourself, but for the people around you. You have the tools. You have the habits. Now, it's time to take action and live a life of true purpose and impact. And there you have it. Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is truly a roadmap to achieving lasting success and fulfillment in all areas of your life. It's not just about doing more. It's about doing the right things that align with your values and long-term goals. Remember, these habits are meant to be practiced over a lifetime, so take it one step at a time. If you found this breakdown helpful and want to keep growing along with us, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for more deep dives into life-changing books like this. And let me know in the comments, what's one habit you're excited to start working on? Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.